Hello, and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. I'm Virginia Prescott, host of GPB's On Second Thought, and your host for these talks. Tonight, I'm talking with Mary Beth Keen about her 2019 novel, Ask Again, Yes. There it is. <laughs> you can purchase the book directly from Acapella Books at the link in the chat. That's just to the right of your screen, and also at the link provided at the Atlanta History Center's website. And we welcome you to submit your questions for Mary Beth. Just click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type them in. It's really better in the Q&A than in the chat. So I only have one thing to look at. And I will try and integrate as many of them into the conversation as our time allows. Mary Beth Keen was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction Writing. She's the author of Walking People, Fever, and most recently, Ask Again Yes, which was an instant New York Times bestseller, and it is now out in paperback. Mary Beth Keen, so great to have you with us. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me virtually. I wish I was there, but here we are. <laughs> We are doing what we can. So this book, if those who haven't read it, follows two neighboring families in a suburban town and a tragedy that divides them and their children over nearly four decades. It's also kind of a Romeo and Juliet story because of that division. Did you think of it like that going in? You know, I don't think that I thought of it quite that consciously, but I did have a sense of a coming together, you know, this real classic romance. Um, in the sense that there were obstacles that they had to overcome and then they overcame them. But I think like in college, when I read Romeo and Juliet in my Shakespeare course, I always wondered what would happen afterwards. You know, had they lived and had to live with one another after that one week of intense passion, what would things have been like? Um, and that's really what it is sort of like for Kate and Peter. You know, they go through a lot together, but it's the mundane parts of life that are kind of the most challenging of all. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Thanksgiving dinners and the like. Especially really if, awesome. you know, your families don't get along, you know, and, um, and they have challenges that they have to, you know, I don't want to spoil the plot for anybody, but um, yeah, they have things from their own lives and their own histories that they carry with them. And a lot of the book was about that, you know, how much of our childhoods we carry with us for the rest of our lives. And do we pass those things on to our kids? Um, and I think those were questions that I had that I didn't know the answers to. And so that's what drove me to sit down and really think about these characters in this book. Mm -hmm. Well, the story is observed primarily through Peter and Kate's eyes, as well as Anne Stanhope, who is Peter's mother, and Francis Gleason, Kate's father. And they go through distinct ages, and of course, they're different genders, and experiences as they age in this nearly 40-year history. So you had to imagine how, the way that they look at the world and how it would evolve. How, do, how deeply did you go with that in developing these characters? You know, I think that writing is a lot like acting, you know, from what I can gather about method acting. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm offending any actors by comparing those things, but I really tried to be each character in a particular moment in time and think the way they would think if I had certain experiences and if I had um, a particular, you know, worldview. Um, so being in the 1970s, you know, knowing what we knew then, you know, I, I read a lot, I talk to a lot of people. Um, it wasn't that, it wasn't that hard, you know, that's sort of the fun part is like adopting a different persona for a little while and, and trying to understand the way that people tick. But Anne Stanhope, um, who you mentioned, was probably the most difficult character to get down because she suffers from mental illness, a mood disorder, um, as one doctor told me to describe it. Um, and that, you know, a definition of a diagnosis changes over time. And what we described one way in the 1970s, we would use totally different words to describe now. And that was one of the main challenges of the book is to be sort of respectful of the illness while also, you know, honoring the way that people were and the way they thought in particular moments in time, 70s, 80s, 90s, now. We've come a long way. And we talk about mental illness differently now, but you know, there's still a long way to go. Yeah, that was a question for me that there's, Anne has, uh, she's, let's say reclusive uh, in some degree to her next door neighbors and her son's friends asking, you know, like, what's wrong with your mother? But this becomes very public when there's a, she has some paranoid delusions and, and I think we can call it that, and a breakdown in public 
yeah. at a deli counter, and this is in the 80s. And, and I was thinking when reading this that we've come so far in understanding mental illness, but have we? You know, the reactions of the people around her are kind of what I would imagine happening today. So tell me about that evolution there. Uh, there is one detail about that scene that I think would look quite differently today. Um, if she, there, I don't want to spoil the plot once again, but she has something in her, there's a discovery made that I think would, she would be treated differently had that discovery been made in 2020. But a lot of the times, and this happened with previous books, when I'm on the road and I'm talking to people who read and judge characters, so often they, people tell me so confidently what they would do in a certain situation. You know, if I saw this, this is what I would do. If a person mm -hmm. acted this way in front of me, this is how I would respond. And I, the interesting thing to me about writing fiction is that I believe that we don't know until we're confronted with a situation how we'd respond. A lot of times when I put characters in action, it's to find out you know, what they're really like, if the different ways that they surprise themselves and the different ways they surprise me. Um, and so I think that if you were an observer to, Anne has an episode at a deli counter, like you said, a lot of people say, I, I've met people who've said, I would have done this, I would have done that. But when you see someone lashing out in the way that she does, I think it's human nature. And it, I don't want to judge that to sort of pull back, you know, and protect yourself, protect your loved ones and try to observe what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. You're right. I don't think that that's changed all that much. I think actually some of the people in that scene were really warm to Anne because they considered her one of their own, sort of. You know, she was of that town. She had children. She had a child there and they knew that. Um, and so I think they responded with more tenderness than maybe they would now, even though we're more educated about um, these different disorders. I of that town is such an important part of this. You grew up in an Irish American community in Pearl River. It's a suburb like Gillum where this story is set in Rockland County. And there are many police officers, many first responders there. This was a, a path for many Irish American immigrants to assimilate. Were there cops in your family? There weren't. I, um, my parents immigrated from Ireland in the 60s. And so I had a lot of aunts and uncles here who immigrated. But for some reason, none of them became police officers. However, uh, the parents of a lot of my friends growing up were cops, you know, particularly the dads. They were detectives in the Bronx in the 1970s. And that's something I didn't figure out until I was much older. I knew yeah. a lot of the times that they were cops, you know, somewhere. I mean, you don't really care what your friend's dad does for a living when you're 10. But it was when I got older and I got to college and I learned more about, you know, the Fort Apache years, the Bronx's burning years, what Manhattan was like um, in that period. When I realized, you know, I started putting two and two together that like Mr. Brennan who used to like skim his pool and his plaid shorts and his, his dress socks pulled up to his knees was in one of the most difficult, you know, precincts during one of the most difficult time in New times in New York's history. And so I guess I just started mulling that over and how you kind of live one happy-go-lucky life at home in the suburbs and one not happy-go-lucky life, you know, on the job. A lot of them also at that time kept their uh, off-duty weapons on them. And I would glimpse those weapons sometimes and feel sort of shocked. My dad, we didn't have a gun in our house. And so to see a gun when you don't have one, I don't know, it's shocking. It still is to me. And so, I don't know, I think I had sort of a fixation on the job of police work since I was probably in grade school. Um, and, and, and I wanted to just make these characters police officers, probably for that reason. On the job is the term that they use for talking about being police. And the details of that experience are so sharp in this book. How did you learn these? Well, it's a language. I mean, they really are their own um, ethnicity, you know, in a way. Uh, police officers, they speak their own language. A lot of times they only understand each other. They have their own traditions. And, you know, they're, they're closed off to outsiders to an extent. And I think that, you know, my privilege was my access. You know, I, I just knew these people. They knew me from growing up. They think it's, for the most part, you know, they get a kick out of the fact that I write books and these books are sometimes in the New York Times, things like that. And so I was able to 
text them and say, would you meet me for a plate of eggs and bacon? And I, I have a couple questions for you. And, um, and as some of them, as particularly the retired detectives from like the 70s, 80s era, were great. They're great storytellers. The thing is, every cop story is really um, polished. You know, I can tell when they're used to telling a story and they've told it a hundred times. Sometimes I wasn't used to, I wasn't really interested in that kind of thing. You know, we've all seen Law and Order and, you know, a cop chasing down a perp. But what I wanted to know was how they felt, you know, how conflicted they felt about their, maybe their power and their position. And I think a lot of the people I talked to weren't used to, you know, talking in that way. Um, mm. The NYPD has gotten a lot better about offering um, counseling and, and ways for their, uh, their, their men and women on the force to sort of get out their feelings. But I think it still has a long way to go. But certainly between the 70s and the 2020s, um, it's come a long way. But it was a strange and sometimes funny experience. But I had access. I just asked a lot of stupid questions and they were willing to answer them and it was great. If you have a question for Mary Beth Keen, you can type it into the Q&A segment that's on the bottom of your screen and I will try to get to those. Um, well, you just talked about the polished way that people don't necessarily say the underlying story. And there, there's, it, this seems like a rich vein in this book, what is not said. There are scenes of domesticity that absolutely crackle with the tension of people just about to say something, but then not saying them. And you also mentioned trauma and how it is, well, we know now carried through generations. And at one moment, in one clear moment, Anne says that the beginning of one's life mattered the most, that real life was top heavy in that way. So we, in, in the book, there's mental illness, there's addiction, and we see how it carries on in the lives of, of the children and the people around them. So what are some of the ways that you, you looked at that and expressed it? Um, I mean, I think, first of all, I'm always interested in characters who are not that articulate about how they feel. Um, you know, I felt like a fish out of water, I think, when I got to college and I was with people whose parents had written books and had been on television. I went to Barnard College in New York City. And I was of, you know, a family that didn't have any of those things. My dad was a construction worker. You know, there were a lot of construction workers and bartenders. And I, I didn't really identify with the, the reading that I was given in English, you know, literature classes. And so, you know, I, I appreciated it and I learned from it. But when I started writing, I was really attracted to the type of character who might say a thing and even think a thing, but then feel a completely different way. That conflict to me is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. About the trauma, I mean, I think that that's the whole thing. That's the center of the book, that some people are able to say, this happened to me and this really hurt me. And some people are just not able to do that for a whole host of reasons. And I am way more interested in the second type of person, um, which is the type of people who make up not only this book, but probably all of my books. But I think there is a moment, you know, any person who is sort of tuned in to how they feel or how a loved one feels. There's a character in this book named Kate who just from loving the person in her life, who is Peter, the other, the star of the book, is able to see how trauma has followed him and is able to see the damage that it's caused. And she does something about it. Um, and I think it's like sort of a common sense approach to um, pain that is really hard to kind of get your arms around. Um, and that, that was a really difficult part of the book. I didn't want to put words in anyone's mouth that they wouldn't have had. Um, but at the same time, I did want them to work through what they needed to work through. And so it just looks different. You know, a lot of this has to do with class um, background. And I, that's really interesting to me, too. So I'm not sure I may have wandered away from your question a little bit. <laughs> but you know, trauma is a really hard thing. It looks differently in different cultures. 
Right. And I think that's part of what I keyed into here in this book. I am from a large, very large Irish Catholic family with multi-generational uh, mental illness and alcoholism, although we didn't certainly call it that, that when I was growing up. And I felt a lot of connection to, especially the 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 trauma of Peter, whose mother was mentally ill, and how he became adultified, for lack of a better word. I mean, the kid was able to cook his own meals and he was doing his own homework as a young teen and even younger than that. So there's a way that one thinks that maybe it's magical thinking that if you behave a certain way, then things will change. You know, yeah, you know? I think Peter imagined that if he just did the right thing and stayed on the right course, all was well. And what happened to him didn't affect him. And of course, that's not true. I certainly, I had a draft where, or not quite a draft, but I had ideas when I was first wondering about him and how he turned out where he might have gone off the rails, you know, the, the kid who has no oversight. I mean, he really had no parents at, at a certain point in his life, and he could have done a lot of things and sort of been forgiven for it. But we've seen that before. And I was really more heartbroken, I think, at the idea of a kid who, when he has total freedom, does all of the things he's supposed to do. You know, he's so buttoned up and he so does not want to make a mistake or be a nuisance. Um, even like there's a moment where he realizes he has to do his own laundry. So he learns, you know, he's embarrassed. He's born with that sense of shame. I think a lot of Irish Catholics have. And he's so he wants to keep himself tidy and keep his place in the world small so that no one finds him to be a burden. Um, but that's a really hard way to be, especially when you need help. And so, of course, it, it follows him and it ends up erupting later on in his life. Uh, Kate also does her own things to try and keep control. You know, she uh, scrubs the house clean for when her husband is coming home from rehab, you know, making sure that she's following her own set of rules. And uh, there's a question here from Linda. She wants to know about your writing process. Like the details of this are so acute of domestic life and the way that people deal with each other. Can you talk a little bit about how you get there as a writer? You know, I think um, it's really hard to articulate. I think that I just take moments, you know, that are sort of ordinary and then you just imagine them. I mean, every couple that's been together for a long time has had a biblical argument. You know, I just don't believe the couples who say that they haven't. And then you just sort of unroll it until it gets to a point where it never got in real life. Like, let's say you and your partner make up, you know, you, you have an argument, you say the terrible things, then you make up. Let's say you didn't, you know, let's say you push that thing. Let's say, you know, this hap this thing that happens that made you uncomfortable once happens every week for a year, you know, what happens then? And I think I'm able, I don't know, to just imagine the ordinary around those things. Um, and I think I've just always maybe been like this. I, I don't know. It's hard to articulate things that feel subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do find like everyday life to be pretty moving. Nothing extraordinary has to happen. So maybe that's how, I don't know. But there's also a, a exceptional um, things that people would not necessarily consider ordinary, like the first person point of view or perspective of being bipolar or having some form of psychosis. So spot on. How did you get inside of that? That was really hard. That was one of the hardest parts of the book. I actually wrote a whole draft without entering Anne's point of view, just because I was really afraid of getting it wrong. And, you know, if people have a person in their lives who's, say, bipolar um, or clinically depressed, and it doesn't, my depiction doesn't look like their loved one, people get really upset, you know, and they get protective of their own experiences. So I was afraid. I read a lot of memoirs. Um, I was lucky enough to have two, um, one psychologist and one psychiatrist who, in my life, who I had access to and would answer questions when I needed questions answered. And at some point, I just had to try going there because I realized if I only looked at Anne from the outside, the reader would not have as much sympathy for her as I wanted them to have, only in experiencing what she experienced, which I think was based in fear. Um, I think 
was I able to sort of find sympathy in my own heart for her? I mean, she does things that are not for some people totally forgivable, I suppose. But I think when I turned those things over, I realized almost everything she does is from a place of fear. You know, I really, I don't know, that warmed me to her. And I felt, I really felt for her to think that she was, even in that, you know, supermarket scene where she lashes out, it feels aggressive to everybody who's watching. But for her, she feels ganged up upon legitimately. And she feels really afraid. And I think if you see another human being who is afraid, I don't know. I think it would take a really toughened heart to not feel for that person. Um, yeah. But that was hard. That was the hardest part of writing this book, for sure. Yeah, it is terrifying on some level to be inside of her mind. But it's also beautiful to see her progress that is made through the book. Of course, many, many decades and very hard won in her case. And having some sympathetic people who are treating her. And in the in in, in the latter part of the book, she actually shocks people by saying things that are maybe obvious, but maybe difficult to articulate. The thing that you were talking about earlier, people who couldn't quite say or, or, or articulate their experience. So she becomes, I think, in a way, a kind of soothsayer. I mean, am I, am I on or am no, I on? Right. I mean, I think she, you know, weirdly, she goes through this terrible thing and she loses her freedom, but she's forced to go to therapy. You know, she's forced to, to take medication that she needed and she's kept there um, for 20 years. And so she learns something from that. I think if short of committing a crime, uh, it's really hard for an adult who's suffering the way Anne was to get the help he or she needs. You know, if you are schizophrenic, but you haven't committed a crime, you know, what do you do with an adult family member who needs help? You can't, you know, you can't mm -hmm. hospitalize them against their will past a certain point. Different, you know, states vary on this. But what is four days going to do? What's a week going to do? And needed those 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and they carry her forward and she's given some tools to, to sort of heal herself and her life. There's a really big theme here of estrangement from the family that goes on in those years. In Peter's case, it's his mother and his father. And I understand that this was part of the origins of the books for you on your husband's side, some familial estrangement. If, if you feel okay talking about it, what were you exploring here? Yeah, I mean, that part of the book is, um, it's, we have a family estrangement that we've just dealt with since we were young. I met my husband when I was 14 and he had a you know, things were difficult for him and we ended up, um, there was an estrangement on his side. It absolutely looks nothing like the book, but because I'm a fiction writer, I'm able to take, you know, certain things and apply them in different ways. And so one thing I've learned about estrangement, I also, you know, I don't want to malign the Irish people, my people, but it does seem really common in Irish families to have, you know, a brother and a sister not talk or a parent or whatever. And I think the thing about it, it's sort of similar to addiction, is that it doesn't happen all of a sudden. You know, nobody says, I'm not going to speak to you, Virginia, for the next 20 years. Uh, it just happens week by week, year by year. You know, and you think, like, we'll probably make up in six months. We'll probably, you know, it just gets kicked down the road. And then next thing you're at a funeral. I've mm -hmm. seen it happen many times. And life just goes like that. And so I think when Peter's father, Brian Stanhope, um, well, I don't want to spoil the plot, but I don't think anybody made a decision that was for life in this book. I think they made decisions for the moment and then they lied to themselves about how those decisions would resolve themselves. And they just didn't, you know, the, you keep postponing a decision and postponing it and next thing it's over. Um, it's just something I've noticed in my life. The same goes with with the drinking to an extent, with any sort of addiction. Um, people lying to themselves, I think is just so fascinating to me to, to watch, to experience, to observe. Um, it's, it's, I, even those re re stupid reality shows, when you see it happening, um, it's fascinating. And people in this book lie to themselves a lot, but the reader knows what's true and what's not. 
I'm thinking of that uh, Frank McCourt's term, Irish Alzheimer's, you know, that he used as a joke to describe when an Irish person forgets everything except their grudges. Right. right. I mean, so much of this book is about forgiveness and the time and the willingness it takes to get there. Um, the Irish certainly don't have a monopoly on, uh, on holding grudges or estrangement, but what do you think it is about the culture that takes such pride in hanging on to those? Or what well, you said, it was a natural evolution, but there's a way that it becomes a part of identity. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't think I know enough to comment on, on the Irish character to that. I mean, I think I already have, but uh, I'll probably get emails about you've that. You've written books about, you know, that your first book about the Irish and Irish Americans. This is, this is a part of what you do. And I just wondered if you'd observed anything about that in particular, about I mean, why. I think I'm just, I think these themes come out, of course, from close observation of particular characters, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think of my job, not that you've asked this, I'm just now just talking, but I, I don't think I'm meant to answer any questions about, I still honestly don't know what I think about forgiveness. I think I wrote this book trying to find out and I'm still not sure what I think. I, I don't think it's, um, sometimes forgiveness in the popular culture is sort of presented as the all, the end all and be all. We all are supposed to forgive and move on, but sometimes it's sort of painted in a way that means you're inviting that person to Christmas and you're, you know, you're incorporated into each other's lives. And I don't think that that is always right and true and healthy. Um, here, you know, in incrementally, they move closer to one another and they're able to put a part of their lives um, that was chaotic to, to rest to an extent. And I think that that's enough at times. I mean, to me, just as an individual, it just seems like such an amazing waste of energy to hold a grudge when someone often doesn't even care or noticed that you're so angry. Um, and I guess I've just observed a lot of it, but I, I don't think I trust myself to make any sort of broad observation about that. Kind of ties into a question from uh, uh, someone who wants to remain anonymous, but asks, when you are drawing from real personal experiences, how do you differentiate them for yourself in your writing? You just mentioned that uh, this is not your experience, but you like the characters in the book you and your husband met when you were 14. So how do you find that separation? You know, I think that's something I do naturally. I think in order to see something clearly, I try to make it, a, you know, I try to be objective. And in order to do that, I make it sort of foreign, you know? And I think that part of it comes, I don't know, it comes pretty naturally. I think I'm also hardest on myself um, and whatever role I play in anything that goes bad in my own life um, and carry guilt about those things. And so in a, you know, in a setting like this where I'm, I'm sort of putting one theme on top of a family that's not mine, I can sort of like spot the me in the situation and try to blame her to an extent, you know, or sometimes I make it a him. Um, but I don't know, making things objective by, I think that's why I write fiction and not memoir. I don't know how people write memoir, personal narrative, things like that that are too close to home because you just can't get any breathing room between yourself and the story. And I think that whole distance, you know, holding it a little bit at arm's length is what I need in order to really see it. Mm. Um, so you mentioned the idea of fascinate, being fascinated with people who are lying to themselves. Is this a way for you to figure out where your own, um, let's say, blind spots failing. might be? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think my own failings, my own blind spots, my own hypocrisy, um, my own littleness in certain things for sure. And I see that, you know, and it's really haunting. Um, and sometimes those are the hardest days when I feel like those two things in fiction and reality are rubbing up against one another. Um, but those are also the days when I know I have to dig a little deeper, you know, mm -hmm. such a weird thing to do all day. Um, <laughs> it really is. I mean, in the lives of others. Mentally, you know, especially when they brush up against themes in your own life and then next thing the school bus pulls up and you have to get kids off and you're, 
going to baseball, you know, and it feels just like a completely, I don't know, turned around sometimes. Well, do you, do you have a kind of routine for that? You feel like uh, you, you do, you know, I'm going to write from this time to this time and then separate from real life or real life just comes crashing in like the school bus. Well, I did until uh, coronavirus took over <laughs> the entire universe. Yeah, when the kids were little, I, I used to get up really early and write before they really got a head of steam going and needed to have their day. But since school has started for my youngest uh, son, who's now in third grade, uh, it's been pretty great. They get on the bus and I write for several hours and then I can exercise or whatever. I usually I run a lot. I, I think it goes really well with writing. I think I don't bring any I, I don't bring a phone or any music or anything and I sort of process what I've done. Um, and then I'm sort of ready for them mentally when they come home. Uh, now I've kind of reverted back to the old ways that I, I used to do when they were babies and I'm getting up really early and trying to get some mental you know, silence before they get up and start putting on their boxing gloves and you know, their baseball bats and whatever else they're doing. So that's that's the routine. I also read a lot. Um, I try to read constantly, and I'm always suspicious of people who say that they're writers and they're working on a book and it's their dream to write a book and all of this stuff, and they just don't read. It's mm -hmm. just not possible uh, to be a writer without reading a lot. You reading mostly fiction, nonfiction? Yeah, mostly fiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we have a couple of ti uh, questions here about the title of the book. Jennifer said, I love the title of your book, which became clear toward the very end. Do you know the title? Did you know the title rather going into the process? When and how did it come to you? I usually think of titles around the end of the first draft of the book. Um, in this case, the title, uh, Jen might know this, but it comes from Joyce. It's from the Molly Bloom soliloquy in Ulysses. Uh, the comma belongs to Scribner Books, which is my publisher. Um, so there were certain texts that when I was stuck, I read over and over again, you know, to start my day when I felt like I just wasn't getting where I needed to go. I sort of lost track of the heart of the story. And some days if, if writing was really not going well, all I would do is read. And one of the things that I went to, sometimes I went to new work, things that were unfamiliar to me, but sometimes I went to things that I knew I loved. And one of those things was the Molly Bloom soliloquy. And it's for those, I know that a lot of, you know, maybe a lot of people haven't read Ulysses, but it's really such a cynical book um, up until a point. There are, it's a couple that is just disintegrating before your eyes. They're nasty to each other and they're petty and they have all their grievances lined up and they're using their daughter against each other. But it switches point of view at the end. It switches from Leopold to Molly and as she sort of recalls their beginning together, you just feel this warmth and you realize that their story is longer than just one day. The book takes place in one day, like the Odyssey. And um, I don't know, it turns from a cynical book to a hopeful one. And I think I always knew that I wanted to write a hopeful book. I, I knew there was darkness in this book with Peter and Kate and Francis and Lena and Anne and everybody but I also knew it had to come, it had to mean something. Um, I think I'd read so many books that were dark and then just went like, ooh, ended even darker. And I thought, why did I read this? And so I wanted something that wasn't like that, but sometimes it was hard to keep track of where I was and how I could possibly turn it around. And, and that was one of the things I read. Yeah, I wondered about that, turning that around. Um, uh, and there's a, a question here about, about which character was easiest for you to describe and one that you maybe struggled with and perhaps had to rewrite or re-envision maybe on that path to coming to something a little more hopeful? Um, I mean, like I said, Anne was the hardest to write. When I, in the first draft, I really saw her as a villain. You know, she was the most toxic. She, she damaged the most things um, all around her. But the book became richer the more I felt sympathy for her. And so that evolved certainly over the draft process. Um, the character who sort of arrived on the page fully formed and who is my favorite character was George. Hmm. Uh, George, he's so lovely. <laughs> he kind of came out of nowhere. Um, in an early draft, he just shows up when he's married uh, briefly 
to a Thanksgiving dinner. And I think in that draft, Peter was drawing a line between what he was observing next door with like endless relatives arriving and his house, which was really quiet. But George was just George. You know, he had flaws, he had his demons, but he was just good. Um, and I loved him. And every time he was on the page, I sort of enjoyed myself. Mm -hmm. I really liked writing him. He's Peter's uncle, but also I think a bit of a guide. You talked earlier about, you know, going to college and not knowing what you were doing. And 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 Peter is sort of bobbing along in that way. And and George is at least somewhat of a steadying force and also brings up all of the things about class that you mentioned earlier. There, there's so much there, uh, obviously. But this is also, I think, a, a, for me, it, was a, it seemed like a glimpse of how the American dream is lived. And, and Francis and Anne are Irish immigrants. Her dreams, I think, are a little bit more grandiose. His may be more humble, but they're still striving for their children. But untethered in some way, you know, dropped into the suburbs. Uh, um, and the suburbs almost becomes a kind of character here. W w was it for you? Um, I think it was, you know, my parents' origin story, you know, looms big for me. I guess that's true for all kids, but my father's from a very remote part of Ireland. My mother is from a small town. And I think, I don't know, when I was a kid and I would think about all of my people on both sides living within the same square mile for like a millennia, and then one day, my dad left for Idlewild Airport and landed. And he used to say that he knew he couldn't go back to Ireland because he'd never find his way back to the airport. All the, <laughs> you know, traffic helixes and the loops. I mean, if you've been, if anyone out there has been to Connemara, you would know what I mean. But I think, you know, to have a piece of property in the United States, really, I don't know. I felt that as a big thing when I was growing up. My parents bought our house. I think we were living in the Bronx and uh, we moved up to the suburbs when I was, I think, three. And, you know, there was still a lot of pride when they talk about those days. You know, they thought they overpaid for our house a little bit and they had to do all of this work and they chipped away at it bit by bit. But there is a lot of pride in that. And when we were growing up, you know, I think I just got lucky they always told us i have three sisters i'm sorry i have two sisters i'm one of three that they would never pay for like a big fancy wedding but they would pay for wherever we wanted to go to college uh mm -hmm. as much as they could you know we ended up taking student loans and stuff like that but not as much as some of my you know cohorts who had a similar sort of upbringing but their priorities really were with you know, educating yourself and bettering yourself in the United States. And they, they love Ireland. They consider it their home still, but the U S you know, still was very much, you know, a thing to aspire to when I was growing up. And the, and the idea that we've made it or we're making it happen was, um, was definitely part of my childhood. Got a couple of nice comments here um, about a gratitude of for plumbing the humanity of your characters in this book in detailed and broad ways, not at all connected to or constrained by a particular culture. Um, but I do want to get to the uh, uh, another question because we just have a couple more minutes. Paige asks, I'm curious about Mary Beth's approach to developing Peter's alcoholism. Was that something she was always interested in writing about or did it organically arise? I think the way the novel depicts it is so much more true to life than more extreme renderings. I agree with that. I, I really appreciate that comment. I think that I had read and seen too many depictions of the fall down drunk, you know, who loses everything. Right. And I was way more familiar with the functional alcoholic who can somehow by some miraculous thing, get up and go to work the next day. Um, you know, alcoholism was something that really hit me. I think when I hit 40 uh, a couple of years ago, I realized that, you know, it's a, it's a mystery to me still sort of like forgiveness, um, and a lot of other things in this book, why some people get out alive and some people don't. I had my first drink young. It was just the way that, like, I don't know, we grew up around here and I know that I don't have a problem you know, with alcohol, I don't know why. And I know some people who grew up the same way I did and who really do, you know, and I, I can't figure it out even now, but I just started thinking about it more and more. You know, I feel like 
everyone was getting along, you know, and you'd have your moments and we'd sort of laugh about a big night out. But then at a certain point, there were some people who just could not stop. Um, and, and I don't know how I got lucky, but it's something that still troubles me, honestly. It's really interesting to me who seeks help and who doesn't, who admits they have a problem and who doesn't, um, what alcohol means to different people and why. And I, I do think about it a lot, but I don't think I thought about it my whole life. I think it's something I just noticed, you know, when I hit a certain age. I couldn't help but think about your previous book, Fever, when um, it just in this time of the pandemic, Mary Malone of County Tyrone arrived in the U.S. in the late 19th century, worked as, as a cook in the homes of many wealthy uh, New Yorkers, became known as Typhoid Mary. She was asymptomatic but spreading the fever. And I wonder if you've been thinking of her at all during this pandemic. Poor Mary, yeah, she really becomes a hit. She has a resurgence every time there's something terrible going on. I think she was really popular during the AIDS crisis, you know, in the 80s. And um, yeah, I have been thinking about her because the central problem uh, in, in her case was whether it was more an individual's rights were more important than the public's health. Um, and it's funny when I went on tour for that book, everyone I met was like, she should have, you know, secluded herself. She should have done this. She should have done that. And, and we're very judgmental. And I said to a lot of those people, but you don't know how it feels to be 30, six years old in the prime of your life and your health and you're earning money and you're supporting yourself in this time where women were not, you know, always able to live without being reliant on a man. You know, would you give all that up just because a doctor told you that you were spreading a disease that you didn't have and never had, you know, and everyone would say, yes, I would. Well, now those same people, I wonder if they're staying home you know, and keeping their masks on and doing all the things we're supposed to be doing. You know, I don't really judge either side. I think it's a really hard thing to be told something about yourself that you don't believe is true. And I think that's why Mary Mallon's case is just always going to be interesting to everyone um, because it's an impossible question to answer. Well, the Fever, uh, Elizabeth Moss was attached as a producer and star for BBC TV. Can you tell us where that project is now? Well, she just renewed, uh, which is good. She's awfully busy. I don't know really anything beyond that, except that she wants to keep this thing alive. Um, and I'm such a, you know, a fatalist. I'm like, oh, it's just going to expire. It's never going to happen. And then she always sweeps in and, and renews it. So that's where that's at. You know, it's alive, it's in development, they're working. Who knows what, you know, Hollywood is up to right now. I think production on everything has stopped. Um, but I would be, it would be such an amazing thing because I admire her as an actress so much since Mad Men, since West Wing, actually. Uh, so that's, I, I don't really know any more details beyond that. Okay, quickly, Jackie wants to know if you have some favorite authors you want to tell us about. Sure, yeah, I have lots. Uh, I just read Louise Erdrich's new book. She's a favorite for me. Um, my favorite of her books is The Roundhouse. Um, and I, I love this new one too. I like everything she writes. Elizabeth Strout is a favorite. Um, I read Olive Kittredge and then I went back and read her whole backlist. Maggie O'Farrell um, is one. Donald Ryan, uh, who's someone I only discovered in the last year. And I read, I, I love when I discover someone in like their sixth book, because then I don't have to wait. I can just go back and read the whole backlist uh, very quickly. Um, probably the most influential writer to my writing is William Trevor, uh, who's now deceased. But his short stories, um, to a large extent, and his novels, to a smaller extent, really shaped the way I write and the way that he um, implicates the reader in the story, even the subjects that he's interested in had a big impact on me. And I still go back and read his short stories when I feel like I'm sort of getting, I don't know, I'm losing the thread a little bit. I wonder, uh, you had your actual in real life book tour last year for Ask Again, yes. Um, and you talked about your process a lot at that time. But so what is it like for you now? You spent four years writing this to revisit these families that you came to know so well as you're talking about them again. 
I mean, I, th- I really haven't stopped talking about them this year. Um, I was supposed to be on a bigger tour right now than I was for hardback uh, last May. And so this is odd uh, to do all of this from home, but I really, this book has been a real surprise to me and probably to my publisher, if I'm being totally honest. I didn't see this coming, like the way that people are um, identifying with this story. And so I haven't, I haven't really stopped talking about them. Um, I have started to be strict with myself about separating what I'm working on now from these conversations because it can be a little bit confusing to talk about, you know, one group of characters in the evenings and then try to work on a different group during the day. But I'm getting, I'm getting the hang of it. I'm getting better. It's certainly easier to do it from home than it would be on the road. So that's a, you know, a blessing in a way. Um, but it's, they are definitely with me, but honestly, even from the walking people, which I finished, which came out in 2009, I still think of those characters too. I think they're all just going to be with me for the long haul. Maybe. I don't know. Anything you want to tell us about what you're working on or how do you feel about that? Uh, you know, I don't like to talk too much about it. I think it takes a little, uh, energy out of it and it makes me just nervous and my superstitious side comes out, but I'm, I'm working and I'm, I'm feeling my way through it bit by bit. Mary Beth Keen, what a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I hope everybody stays healthy. Mary Beth Keen, she's the author of Ask Again Yes, more recently, as we mentioned, two previous novel, The Walking People and Fever. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. You can join us next Thursday evening, May 21st, when I'm going to talk with Stephanie Danler about her new memoir, Stray, on Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. And you can find more information, a schedule, and Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, everybody.